One of the things that I, I keep trying to talk with folks about across the state is the, the fact that older lawyers who are experienced trial practitioners have an obligation to the profession to share what they know about their trade with younger lawyers. We, we hear a lot of criticism these days about what exactly young lawyers coming out of law school know, how well they've been trained on practical clinical skills, on judgment, uh, making abilities on communication with written and oral. And as older lawyers, we have an obligation to share that. Well, you're not going to find a finer set of individuals with the skill sets and the experience than those who are before you today on this panel regarding evidentiary matters and the introduction of documents. Your moderator today is the Honorable Larry B. Kirksey. He's retired from the circuit court bench, but of course continues to sit there by designation. He had served as a judge in the 28th Judicial Circuit. And before that, he had practiced with Woodward, Miles, and Flanagan in Bristol since 1976. I, I know Judge Kirksey, having watched him perform his craft in Lee County and in federal court when I was both over there working with Judge Lewis as an intern and with Judge Clayton Williams as a law clerk. And he now currently is an active mediator with the McCammon Group and we can all join together in thanking him for this fine lunch that we just had here today. He spent the better part of this morning preparing barbecue in those buns. Uh, next is Mary Lynn Tate, who's no stranger to I'm sure the folks around here. Uh, Mary Lynn's a principal in her own law firm, Tate Law Firm PC, practices civil litigation, state and federal, all across the country. She primarily focuses on uh, medical malpractice and products liability injury cases, premises security, and business disputes. She's a co-director of the National College for Trial Advocacy at the University of Virginia. If you've not had an occasion to attend that, I would strongly recommend it. I've had the privilege of serving there on a couple of occasions as one of its faculty members, and it's top-notch first grade. She's a fellow of the International Academy of Trial Lawyers and a fellow of the Virginia Law Foundation, a member of the Boyd Graves Conference, and she's a past president of the Virginia Trial Lawyers Association continues to serve on its board and has been the recipient of its Distinguished Service Award. And finally, she's the recipient of the Brennan Award from the University of Virginia School of Law. She has a passion for training. She has a passion for training. And she's one of the best there is in the country at it. Roger Mullins, also a past president of the Virginia Trial Lawyers Association. He's one of our own locally. He uh, is a former chair of the Board of Graves Conference. His practice is across the board. He's a former Commonwealth attorney, county attorney, commissioner of the county. So his current practice includes dispute resolution, personal injury, business, real estate, civil litigation, and probate matters. And he has the distinction of being an alma mater, both undergraduate and law school, of that team down in Alabama that has held the national championship for two of the last three years. So three of the last four years, I'm not sure of age. Roll tight. Uh, finally, uh, Wade Massey, again, uh, one of the top-notch litigators not only in this area but in the state. Wade's with Penn Stewart, he's been there since 1977, maintains his licensure in three states, Virginia, West Virginia, and Tennessee. Uh, he represents his uh, primarily on the defense side, that's where I've known him because that's typically where my practice has been. Numerous companies and individuals, particularly in the energy industry across this region. He's a fellow of the American College of Trial Lawyers, the American Bar Foundation, the Virginia Law Foundation, and he's been very actively involved with the Virginia Bar Association and is a faculty member for the Virginia State Bar's Professionals, of course. So, with no further ado, Judge Kirksey, uh, I invite you all to join me in greeting these folks. Thank you very much, David, and uh, greetings. Hello. Thank you. Um, it's a distinct uh, honor and privilege uh, for myself, as well as Mary Lynn, Roger, and Wade to be before you today. Uh, right off at the front of things, we would certainly commend the Virginia State Bar, uh, your leadership of the respective bar associations, um, all the folks that have been involved in making this happen. Um, 
I don't know, perhaps it's been said earlier today to you, but the attendance today, uh, well, it would, it would rival the, the uh, turnout for a presidential election. I understand that somewhere close to 45% of the practitioners in our area are in attendance today. And uh, that speaks yards about uh, the interest of our bar associations here in our area. Uh, it sends messages to those that need to receive them uh, that uh, when presented with opportunities to learn more, uh, we appear both members of the bar as well as members of the bench and those of us who are has-beens like myself. Um, so we want to thank the Virginia State Bar. Uh, I'm sure that uh, my fellow members here, my colleagues on the panel will do as well. I also want to raise uh, a question to you or at least an observation to you. If you've got your, uh, your schedule of events for today, uh, there's, there's, there's a terrible mistake on this, uh, if you look down about halfway, um, there's a correction I asked you to make where it says 1 to 2.30 p.m. breakout sessions. There's a topic called Documents and Business Records Introduction, Authentication and Admissibility. If you'd strike through that and say, nap time. <laughs> when, uh, when we were called upon to uh, to present this topic, um, obviously at the hour that it is and the topic that it is, uh, we nearly took a nap. But fortunately, uh, as was alluded to by David, we have a lot of maturity uh, here. Uh, if you count maturity by, by, by years. Um, we have in this group over 150 years of, of time as lawyers and or judges, if you will. And it's amazing the opportunity that has been had to be in the presence of these three individuals as we were planning things, what we were able to, to come up with. We hope this will be something that you can take away with you. Um, I know from seeing the looks on many of your faces as, um, as I was sitting there during David's introduction, there were a few smirks, there were a few, oh boy, this is gonna be fun. Uh, the microphones are there for your pleasure. Fortunately, there are no bags of tomatoes to throw at the presenters, but we're certainly here to hear from you and your observations, um, and we would invite you to do so. I understand that uh, this is being videoed and for presentation elsewhere within the Commonwealth. Um, I'd like to say that my name is Butch Flanagan, if there's anybody that's watching this. I also have an AKA of Larry Kirksey, and uh, uh, that's that. I also want to tell you that if you're watching this, um, this is being done on April the 26th of 2013. And uh, yes, you too can be a judge someday. Um, let's, uh, let's get to what we're here for, though, folks. Uh, in your materials is a set of documents that are called documents and business records. Introduction, authentication, and admissibility. And that, that uh, bit of material includes some very interesting sites to the rules of evidence, as well as case law that uh, we, we intend to, to throw out to you today. This is not intended in any way to be a compilation of everything that's applicable, but it's certainly direct and useful. Um, our, our goal here is not to lecture you today. In that sense, we decided the best opportunity was to pre present to you some hopefully well-crafted examples uh, done with uh, uh, role-playing, if you will, by the, the panelists' um, vignettes. They, are, they appear throughout the outline, and I'll cite you to those as we, we go through it. That's the format we, we thought best to use for you, so if you make sure you have those materials at hand, uh, it would be much more sensible and, and easier to follow when you do that. Now. One other thing that I discussed with uh, everyone in, in our group, everyone has an arsenal that is a bare bones, this is what I've got to have when I step into the courtroom. Uh, one of my colleagues, for example, never will step up on the bench uh, 
without having before him what he refers to as my friend, friend, and that's friend on evidence. And many of you will know who I'm speaking of when I say that. And he relies upon my friend, friend on his bench. I can't do that. It's, it's, it's hard for me to find things in it quickly enough when I need it. It's great to have back in the, in the chambers when I'm stepping away to try to make some decision on something I'm not quite comfortable with. But there are two sets of, of volumes that I'm telling you, if you do not have them, uh, the first chance you get an opportunity to buy them, uh, Mary Lynn said, go without lunch to buy them. Right, Mary Lynn? Are these two sets, okay? Anyone, man or woman, who sits on the bench, my colleagues that are here will nod their heads, I'm sure, in agreement. When we step on the bench, there's at least these two volumes that every, every, every member of the bench, every judge has, all right? Number one, the judges and practitioners bench book. About this day, of the civil and criminal bench book. They train us judges to rely on those documents as a quick source of material information. They're very inexpensive. They're updated annually. They're reviewed by a committee of individuals. This includes Tom Warren as chairman, has been for years. I don't know if he's going to continue, Judge Warren, when he retires. And a list of, of judges throughout the Commonwealth that review it annually. Uh, it is a quick resource, nothing finer. It's indexed in the ways that we think. It has appendices that are reasonable and rational. Got to have it. All right? Both the civil and the criminal bench book. The second volume has become more important, and I think, again, all of, the, all of my colleagues will carry it. It costs you about $50. Everyone got this? All right, I didn't see a show of hands. I'm not asking for it. This is a guide to the rules of evidence in Virginia. Virginia CLE Publications. No, I'm not on the, on the payroll up there. But this book has all of the Virginia rules of evidence. Uh, as they appear in, in Rule 2 of our Virginia Rules. In addition, they have the comments to the rules. Those do not appear in the official version as it is in the, in the Rules of the Supreme Court. You've got to have it. Everyone relies on it. Buy it. Acquire it. We will be using it frequently here today. All right? Let's, uh, let's flip over to the vignettes uh, as they would be. And uh, if you'll look on, uh, I'm going to take these a little bit out of order in terms of how they appear in the outline, but if you'll turn to page 11 of your outline, this is a uh, demonstration vignette, if you will, that deals with the admissibility of medical records. Many of you have this occasion, it has come up and will come up in your practice. Uh, concerning a bodily injury, personal injury case. Uh, factually, and what we'll do in the setup of this is um, uh, we have a, an attorney playing the plaintiff's role. We have an attorney playing the defendant's role. And then we have a, an expert witness in this matter. We have um, Dr. Mullins, if you will, playing the role of the doctor. Um, and the, the factual video is to review with me because it is essential to your understanding of what we'll be doing here is Mary Arnold was injured in an automobile accident in April of, 2000, April of 2011 and she brought suit against the driver, Mr. Wallace, for her personal injury. And at the trial, uh, the plaintiff's counsel was calling the treating physician. Mary Lynn, of course, is playing the role of the plaintiff's counsel. She was calling the treating physician that we listed in here as Donald Sutherland to testify about the injuries and Dr. Sutherland who was with a family <coughs> practice group and Dr. Sutherland will testify that he saw the plaintiff about a week after the accident and she was complaining of neck, back pain, headaches, and nausea. Based on that history uh, of those problems beginning after the accident, Dr. opined that her problems were caused by the accident and he diagnosed her Difficulty is a post concussion syndrome. Uh, 
doctor, the good doctor will be cross-examined by Wade Massey on behalf of the defendant Wallace. Mr. Massey wants to introduce the chart of this plaintiff. And the chart consists of all of the medical records and examination of this individual by that family practice group over a period of a decade, not just since the accident. And the chart includes several things. It includes uh, prior histories given by the plaintiff concerning blurred vision, dizziness and headaches, that's the prior history, and then there's prior x-rays uh, that read she was uh, showing degenerative changes in her cervical spine, and of course uh, prior opinions by other physicians uh, that the said the plaintiff suffered from migraines and a condition of cervical disc disease. Uh, that's all within the chart over that 10 year period. Um, the doctor is called as a witness and elicits some testimony about the injuries and links them to the accident on cross. Wallace uh, gets Sutherland to identify the chart and uh, at some point in time we're going to hear out of the uh, mouth of Mary Lynn some objections to what's going on here. You all kind of anticipate how this will flow from there. With that being said, then I want to pull that mic a bit closer and see like Sustained. Doctor, did you make a note 
note of the relationship between her specific complaints and the specific locations that she said were impacted during the accident? Yes, I uh, asked her specifically because she did have a history. And uh, based upon my examination, she was able to specify particularly how those symptoms uh, occurred, how frequently they occurred, and where in her uh, torso that she experienced that pain. Did you also conduct or order imaging studies for her? I did. And did you examine the results of those imaging studies? I did. Did you rely on her complaints and the imaging studies in making your total assessment? Yes, I did. Did you uh, note that her description of the accident was consistent or not, not consistent with her physical complaints? Well, they were consistent. So that that what, it was what led to my diagnosis. And what was your concluding diagnosis for Ms. Wallace, Ms. Arnold? Well, she, uh, of course, had a traumatic injury, and her symptoms were consistent with what we call post-traumatic uh, concussion syndrome. Did you observe um, on her head, um, the um, evidence, any evidence of trauma to her head? Yes, she did have a contusion uh, on her temple. And was the location of that contusion consistent with the imaging study reflecting concussion? Yes. In your opinion, doctor, do you, do you find that the symptoms she described in diagnosis you arrived at are uh, linked and were caused by the automobile accident which she also described to you. Object to the leading and to the form of the question, not to the proper survey. Judge be sustained, rephrase your question, counsel. Dr. Sutherland, did you arrive at an opinion with respect to the cause of the diagnosis of post-concussion syndrome? Yes, I did. And in arriving at that diagnosis, And her, her uh, history. And did you also consider your background training in the medical profession? Of course. And while we thought this had been stipulated to you, let me ask you now. <laughs> At the time of this examination, were you licensed to practice medicine in Virginia? Yes. Where did you receive your medical degree? University of Virginia. I'll breathe next period. <laughs> <laughs> Accept that stipulation, counsel? Oh. Absolutely. All right. Very well. Proceed. So, Dr. Sutherland, um, are the uh, injuries sustained by Ms. Arnold consistent with post-traumatic concussion syndrome? To the leading again. Counsel, please rephrase your question. Thank you, Judge. Was, was that sustained? Yes. I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon. Rephrase your question, the judge did sustain. Thank you, Judge. You're welcome. <laughs> Do you have an opinion with respect to the cause of this uh, artist's injuries? Objection not to the requisite certainty, Your Honor. Objection's overruled. Yes, I do. visit that she comes in uh, for examination or treatment of 
what occurred during that visit. Is that true? Yes, that's the protocol of our practice. And those notes are filed in the patient's chart, is that correct? And if x-rays or tests are ordered, those are also filed. The results are also filed. Those are to be in a chart. Now these are records that are made and kept in the regular course of your business and practice, true? Yes. And the regular practice to make these records. Oh, absolutely. Treating this patient, as you said on the direct, you had occasion to review these records and allow them to for what they say. Oh, of course. I'm going to show you now what's been marked as Exhibit 1. And I'll ask you, is that a true copy of this Objection. Counsel, if you would please allow the question to be completed. Excuse me, Your Honor. The status of the question that he has not identified the document correctly. It's only been marked for identification. It's not yet an exhibit in the case. Madam, please complete your question. Doctor, I show you a stack of documents that have been marked, marked for identification as exhibit one, and I'm asking you if you can identify these as the chart of this one. Just a moment, let me look. Yes, they certainly appear. Now, I'll ask you also if this chart, this complete chart, contains these office notes of visits before the accident where you saw Ms. Arnold. Yes, to the best of what I can tell, they're all there. And it also contains some prior x-ray reports, x-ray reports prior to this accident. Yes. And it also contains notes of other physicians prior to this accident when they saw her, correct? Yes. We offer the chart as exhibit one, Your Honor. Objection. Counsel has not laid the proper foundation for business records. Can you be more specific? Lack of foundation for the business records exception. And it's not my job to tell Mr. Massey how to introduce his evidence. Do you wish to be a bit more specific, Counsel? That's his job, Your Honor. Lack of foundation. Objection is overruled. The chart is admitted. That ends the presentation of that vignette. Now, what happened? Anybody care to make a comment about what happened? How that objection was made? Did I not invite something a bit more specific with respect to the chart? Obviously, I did. And Counsel was intent just to allow things to proceed as they were going to proceed. Not my job. Is that right, what you said, ma'am? I think that's exactly what I said. And that's almost what the Counsel making the objection did in the case on this point. This is Arnold v. Wallace. It's a 2012 case from the Supreme Court of Virginia. The error here was in the way the objection was made. It's simply not enough to say lack of foundation. And especially not enough when what you're really trying to do is keep particular records out or particular inadmissible pieces of evidence that may be in the record out. In this particular case, the medical records contained opinions. Opinions of other practitioners in the office, prior opinions of this doctor in the office, that reflected comment and prior opinions about pre-existing conditions, causes of other symptoms that might or might not have been related to the specific condition. And our Supreme Court said it's insufficient to object to foundation, as you say, with respect to records that would otherwise be admissible generally as business records. You have to be specific. And if what you really want to have excluded are the opinions or other inadmissible comments within those records, you have to make those specific opinions. And that can be done without telling opposing counsel how to do his or her job. That can be done by having the doctor explain the basis for his or her opinion. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. We'll take this matter under advisement.
having already gone through the record, anticipating the objection or anticipating that the offer would be made and that he would have to object, identifying the admissible uh, comments in the record, also have redacted copy for convenience with parties, and you know you'll have to make some, such an objection, and make it correct. Hearsay with respect to opinion contained in those documents, Your Honor, or other uh, the, the, the case of Arnold versus Wallace is in your materials. Uh, it's a very recent case, just a little more than a year ago from our from the Supreme Court, April of last year at uh, 283 Virginia 709, uh, as it is. A very succinct opinion that says that, that it is incumbent upon the objecting party to identify the passages within a business record offered into evidence that contain inadmissible opinions. Um, Arnold's objection, Lynn's objection here to foundation did not apprise the circuit court of additional specific objections to opinions in the chart. Uh, when they went up on appeal, that objection was waived. Um, several teaching points throughout this vignette, uh, firstly, you know, when, when the court invites you for a bit more information, you know, we're not just trying necessarily to, to buy time and make a decision. Very often we're saying, uh, come on now, let's, let's do your best to give me something here to go with. Accept the invitation. Um, and as Lynn has said, you know, be thinking on your feet. You know, just because you get a response back that's kind of an inquiry, don't, don't, don't panic about it. Uh, you know, the court's wanting something. Sincerely wanting something. And step back and think for a minute and, and, and see where you're going to go with it as opposed to saying it's not my job, it's his job. Uh, nothing men would ever do that necessarily in the courtroom, I'm sure. Um, the, uh, the case of Neely versus Johnson as well needs to be uh, brought up for your attention as well. And I know each of us up here are prepared to address it in perhaps ways you can speak more fully to uh, Neely versus Johnson. Uh, before you do so, I want to point out a couple of things of interest to you, and I see uh, a couple of my colleagues in the back kind of squirming a bit about that case. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, I'm watching, folks. Uh, <laughs> this Neely versus Johnson is not in your outline materials, but it, most of you will know of it. It's at 215 Virginia 565, 215 Virginia 565. It's a 19. 75 case. I first heard about it several months after I started practicing law. Uh, this, this opinion came out back then. It was a new case, and I still think of it as a new case. <laughs> but now, some 40 years later. But, uh, and if Wade goes about and tells you more of the significance to you, let me show you just a couple of things that are of interest now. And, you know, when I first read these things 40 years ago, you know, I didn't really care about some of these little wrinkles in the cases, but now after all this time, history is starting to mean something to me. But this case came out of the Circuit Court of Fairfax County, you know, way up there in Northern Virginia. Maybe some of the folks that are watching the video now are up in Fairfax. But um, this case came out of Fairfax County, but do you know where the plaintiff lived? The plaintiff in this case was uh, Clinton W. Neely, Jr. He lived here in Abington, Virginia. He got in a mishap up in Fairfax and he got run over up there by somebody. Some good Fairfax citizen ran over him up in Fairfax County, but it was an Abington, Virginia resident. And the doctor that was involved in this case, um, most of the doctors, some were in Abington, but one in particular that a lot of my generation of plaintiff's lawyers and defense lawyers will recognize was uh, Dr. Kuhnert. Uh, I hope there's somebody here who remembers Dr. Kuhner, but he was on that plaintiff side of, of uh, orthopedic surgeons. And then on the defense side, we had Dr. G. Gordon McFadden. Remember those names? Dr. Kuhner was involved in this case. And uh, another interesting point for you to, to see, you know, you like, you like to have your judges make rulings. And we judges resisted very often. And they talk about the old judges and how they work. Well, if you look down here, these medical records that were tendered on day one of the trial were refused by the judge on day one. 
Day two, the judge said, you know what, I think I'll let those in. So they come in on day two. I don't, I don't know what happened on day three. But on day four, the judge says, no, I was right the first time. they got to stay out. <laughs> so those are just some interesting sidelights to Neely versus Johnson. Wait, what can you tell these folks about Neely versus Johnson? You've done a good job, Judge. Uh, the one thing to, to take away, I think, on this issue is uh, we have a set of documents. They were properly authenticated. They are business, professional records, right? But yet, the case law seemingly says, we're not going to let all that in. And the part that they're not going to let in is what is called opinions of absent people, right? Clearly, if it was a record of this doctor, and I'm going to show it to this doctor to impeach him, I can do that. But if I want to introduce opinions of other doctors who aren't here, then I may have a problem with that. Rejection is made. What if they're part of my practice and we all rely on them? Well, that, that may be leading to another direction where I can impeach you with that record that you've said you relied on it, so therefore I can show it to you and impeach you with it. But again, I'm trying to get this as a Affirmative, positive proof of the truth of the matter uh, that these doctors had in their prior opinion. So it, it's a, it can be a problem, and it's not just medical records. When you think about other business records that may have something in them besides uh, pure facts or numbers, they may have opinions or conclusions, and uh, you know, this is an issue. Now, the way it's exactly correct, the, the, the rule as it's contained within the Virginia rules that you'll have in your book as you're sitting there would be Article 8 of the uh, Rule 2, uh, which deals with hearsay. It's more specifically Rule 2, colon, 803, subsection 6 of Rule 2, colon, 803, that deals with business, business records as an exception to hearsay and the foundation that way very artfully laid with regard to the manner in which these records are kept, uh, regular conduct of business activity, um, how he knew how these things were done and how they were relied upon and essentially establishing their trustworthiness. Now some of the comments in the records as well with regard to, for example, this matter was uh, you know, an, an admission by a party uh, as well as then existing medical condition, physical condition, those who also appear in Rule 2, 803, under the very first one, which is labeled zero, and then under uh, number three of that, that, that subpart of that rule. Uh, those, those are the rules that, that we would now rely upon. This authority uh, that you would see as well. Um, any, any other observations, Lynn? The other point I would make here is that, in part, my direct examination, knowing we were going to, to get the offer chart um, went beyond what I would normally do. I, I would not be asking him if he considered all the chart necessarily. I would stick to the events of the particular examination of his opinions. And by the way, Dr. Roger um, Sutherland was being a little too helpful. I would punch in at the end of my witness and say, answer my question, don't argue my case for me. Uh, but, uh, but those are other tactical issues that you need to I wanted you to know that, that we were also imparting other teaching points along with these specific records. I was trying to help my friend Webb. Great job. Any other objection that you uh, noted or any other concern that you saw from that vignette? Uh, members of the panel or anybody here in the audience? Uh, well, if you read 203, uh, I mean 803 6, it talks about business records. It would appear that in this practice, it was part of that practice's protocol for all of the records to be a part of the chart. And the doctor testified that he relied on everything in the chart in formulating an opinion. And as long as 
the, and I'll read that, unless the source of information or the method of, or circumstances of preparation indicate the lack of trustworthiness, it should be admitted as a business record. But the conflict is opinion and law. No, sure. It's hearsay opinion. And so there is the rub. It looks like it's admissible under this statute, but the case law saying opinions are not keeps it out. In practice, it seems from what I've seen of cases, and many of you that are plaintiffs' lawyers, defense counsels like have had the same experience, and Lynn has mentioned be prepared to have you know, a sanitized version with opinions omitted and the like, is it can be a nightmare figuring out exactly what is fact and what is opinion, and how you go about making that determination. Um, you certainly don't want to do it during the course of the trial. You can imagine what that's going to do to the juries. You've lost your jury. Uh, you very well may be getting a, a raised eyebrow from the court. <laughs> what do you mean you want to sit down here with a magic marker and start scratching through some things? But it can be a nightmare even if you do it several days ahead of time uh, with respect to what is or is not an opinion. And it's been my experience that most folks will just simply say, no, I'm not going to try to get it as an exhibit uh, for, for fear that it's just going to be one of those stumbling blocks that you don't want to have in your case if you're from the defense side or plaintiff side. You want the case to be presented promptly to the jury. Another point that we saw that I'd like to bring up is something that I find particularly uh, unfortunate, at times irritating, is an over-exuberance to make an objection before the question is completed. And I know some of my colleagues have said the same thing. When a lawyer interrupts another attorney in the process of asking a question to make an objection. To me, that's like, no, don't do it. You don't even have the question on the table. Allow the question to be made before you interject your objection. Do not interrupt counsel in the process of that question. Feel free to get on your feet if you wish to get ready for it if you want to, but do not interrupt before that question is completed. Fair enough. Wade, Lynn, Roger, anything else on this particular video? Anyone else? Uh, yes, sir. Ed, we are. Uh, Just a minute. Let's get a microphone here, please. I'm sorry to call you over like that, but fair, fairness to everyone. Ed Weiner. Yes, sir. Ed. In the interest of full fair disclosure, I'm president elect of the Fairfax County Bar Association. <laughs> Glad to have you here. I, I, I felt the warmth. <laughs> I knew it. Um, in response to your last comment about <clears throat> interrupting in the middle of a question, sometimes uh, my sense is in front of a jury. The whole question comes out, and then the jury sees you objecting to it. They're immediately feeling that, okay, this guy wants to, definitely does not want us to hear the answer to that question. And if you know what the question is going to be, I understand for the clarity of the record, but do you have a suggestion of how to deal with that? Because just sometimes the asking of the question can feel like it's, it's uh, had an effect. Go ahead, man. Go ahead. It, it's really difficult to, to gauge those circumstances, and, and we need a judge's point of view, but the, the fear on the part of the lawyer is that the rest of the question is going to be as damaging and as mind-infiltrating and, and behavior-modifying uh, to the jury as uh, you're objecting to it. And the reason I did this in the yet was because the presumption was being created already an exhibit in evidence in the case. And I think there are times when um, a judge should back up and say, you know, I realize the question is not fully on the table, but is there a reason for me to hear your objection 
all the members of the bench in the audience. Um, I can remember in a criminal case, a prosecuting attorney in another jurisdiction was in the middle of a question. And he was going to ask a question that included matter that I absolutely knew was prohibited and had been prohibited by order in limine before the trial. And it was so important to the case, I screamed. I mean, I, I, there's, there's another lawyer, um, a, a former partner is in the audience who was there and heard it. And part of my scream was, objection! And it was a lot, lot louder than that. Because I did not want the jury to hear the rest of that question. And the judge, um, if I'm remembering correctly, it was Judge Flanagan, because we had been moved to another jurisdiction for the venue change. And he knew why, in that case, I was making the objection. And, and he really um, set this uh, prosecutor down the chambers. So Ed, I think you make a good point. And, and I think it's a good teaching point on two grounds. Not just that it may need to be heard then, but also, we're also fearful that if we don't get it out quickly, <coughs> that the answer may come at the end of the question before we get it out. So those, those are lawyers' fears. They're real fears, and we need, we need the bitches understanding what we do that. Well, I, I understand what you're saying, and Ed, sounds like you have a kindred spirit here in Abbey, you know, your, your concern as well. But, but it, it, the suggestion would be, you've asked how to handle that situation. Well, you know, it's hardly ever a case anymore, it seems, uh, Judge Lowe. Um, uh, you have it as well, uh, that we don't see motions of limine taken up in some fashion before trial date. And, you know, if it's that bad a question, if you know it's going to come up, um, you know, it's motions in limine are about as close to an advisory opinion as you can get from the court. Uh, most of the time, uh, the judge can deal with it. Sometimes we have to say, listen, I can't address it until I hear more of the flow of the evidence, but why don't you let me know when you get to that point we may want to just uh, excuse the jury and let it come in for a little test run, if you will. So you can certainly address it pre-trial with motions in limine. That's pretty much become a practice down this way. And uh, in my retired life, I can tell you it's more than just Bristol, Washington County, Smith County. I've sat uh, several times as far away as Botetourt County, great little place if you ever go there, uh, as well as up in Wise County and other places. And everybody seems to be very prone to file motions in limine, both from plaintiff side, defense side. Very often they're even agreed to resolve. Don't do them on the morning of the trial. You got a jury there, we're ready to roll. Let's get the show going on. Another way to do it would be uh, potentially to alert the court. Uh, most, most, of the, most of my colleagues are similar to myself. We'd like to hear from you of anything that's going to be coming around that day that we might be alert to during the evidence. The last case I presided over uh, about a month ago was up in Wise County. It's an automobile case, and, and counsel on that matter were very well experienced folks. And they had the, um, uh, the courtesy to tell me that one of their issues, about the only issue in that case, was something called last clear chance. I went, oh, gosh, last clear chance. Maybe Tom Scott knows that the rules on last clear chance off the top of his shoulders, but I sure didn't. I mean, and they gave me a cue. So cue up the court, if you will. That's another way to do it on that morning, okay? Thank you for your question. Um, follow up, if you'd allow me. Would it be um, advisable or permissible to ask if the objection is sustained, sustained, to ask that the judge advise, to ask that the question be struck? Sometimes I feel like that almost takes the red highlighter and now the jury's even listening more to it. Well, you know, again, that's, that's, that's your choice if you wish to. And I mean, the juries typically are instructed, you know, any objections, general, the general instructions, you know, if, if it's refused, you should disregard it, but if you would wish to have me remind them to disregard it, sometimes they'll say, oh my God, what did they want us to hear? What did they not want us to hear? So, you know, you can highlight it that way as well. So, thank you very much.